Okay, the second part of module three is solving story problems, everybody's favorite. And actually, to teach about solving story problems is very difficult because, from my experience, the only way you really get any good at solving story problems is simply to do it. And the first few times you solve story problems, it's very difficult and it's a struggle. But once you figure it out, and then you do it again the next time, and the next time, each time you do it, it gets easier. It's almost like exercising. If you decide you want to go start lifting weights, <clears throat> of course, the first time you lift weights, it's going to be hard, and you're very sore afterwards. But the next time you do it, it's not quite as hard. You're not quite as sore. And then the third or fourth time, you're not really sore at all, and you start to get in shape. That's how story problems are. As it turns out, story problems, there are typically four or five or six types. So the more you do story problems, once you see a story problem, you'll automatically say, oh, I've seen this before. And then you'll sort of remember about how to solve it. And then if you do enough story problems, you get to the point where oftentimes you'll see a story problem and right away. You'll look at it and say, I know how to solve it, and, and you'll even think it's not very hard. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take, I don't know, three or four or five. I'm going to work out some story problems that are really almost exactly like the kind in the homework. I'm not going to do them all, but maybe three or four or five, just to sort of give you a feel of how to think about story problems, how to go about solving them, how to write them down. Um, you know, I can't write out steps for every story problem because all the story problems are different. But once again, it's just, yeah, it's a little tricky. But the only thing i found to do that can help sometimes is to do some examples. And once you look at these examples, you can go in the homework and figure out the ones I did, and then maybe you can even figure out some of the other ones. So I'm going to read a story problem. I don't know which homework problem this is for you, but when I read it, if you look at your homework problems, you'll see one that sounds just about like this. So for me, this first one, actually it's labeled like a banking problem. So I'm going to read it, and then you can look through your homework and see which one this is like. But this one says, a bank loaned out $12,000 Part of it at the rate of 8% per year, and the rest at the rate of 18% per year. If the interest received totaled $1,000, how much was loaned at 8%? All right, you may want to take a minute and go find that homework problem so you can sort of be looking at it. The basic equation when we have these banking or money problems is, the idea is we're looking at putting money in a bank and having it gain interest. And the equation we're going to use is the interest I that you receive from a bank is the principal, P, how much money you put in the bank, times the interest rate, R, and that's going to be as a decimal. A lot of times... One of the problem, they give you the interest rate as a percent, but we have to convert percent to a decimal. And then times the time, the number of years that the money's in the bank. So for this problem, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort of read through it slowly and try and mark down the information they give me. And then once I sort of make notes about what's going on here, then I will try and decide how to try and solve it. Matter of fact, the whole principle of a story problem is you have a bunch of words, a bunch of sentences with some data, some numbers, and somehow we have to try and come up with some kind of equation that describes, that characterizes all the words. This is the hard part. Once you have an equation, the, 
then you find the solution. That's usually the easy part. This last step is just math, solving an equation. The hard part is going from all these words to come up with an equation. So for this one, so a bank loaned out $12,000. So actually, the P is going to be $12,000. That's how much the loan was. Now this 12000 was broken up into two loans. One of the loans had an 8% interest rate. That tells you how much money you had to pay the bank for the loan. But then there was a second loan, and it was at 80%. There was a second loan, it was a lot worse rate. You had to pay a lot more money. So somehow the $12,000 was split up into sort of two loans, and these loans had different rates. This 8%, 18% are the R, the interest rates. Now for this problem, although it doesn't say it, it's sort of assumed that we're going to base everything on one year. like what happens in one year. So as it turns out, it says the interest received totaled $1,000. So you took an initial amount of money, it's two separate loans, we don't know how the money was split up, but when we get all done, when we total the amount of interest, from the two loans, it was a thousand. And ultimately, they're asking how much money was in the eight percent loan. Normally, when area has a story problem, whatever they're asking you to figure out, that's always what we're going to define as our variable, and most of the time. We like to use x, so let's just say we'll let x equal the money in the 8% loan. Could be $1,000, could be $5,000, could be $10,000. It's going to be something between 0 and $12,000. I don't know what it is. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Now, based upon this, if X is the amount of money in the 8% loan, then what would be the amount of money in the 18% loan? Well, it's whatever's left over, right? So if I started with $12,000, doesn't it make sense? I can say 12,000 minus X, the initial amount of money, subtract the money I put in the 8% loan. Well, this is how much money in the 18% loan, right? So if X is how much is in the 8%, then 12,000 minus X, in other words, all the rest of the money, has to end up being in the 18% loan. So let's go ahead. The interest is going to come from two places. We're going to have the interest earned by the money in the 8% account and also the interest earned by the money in the 18% account. I could write it this way. The total interest is going to be the interest from the 8% plus the interest from the 18%. Now they tell me, they tell us, when this is all done, the interest is $1,000. So the total interest I get is 1000 Now what, how can I calculate the interest from the 8% loan? Well, here's the equation to calculate interest. It's how much money you have in that loan 
times the interest rate, and in our case, the time is one year. So in our case, it's going to be how much money is in the 8% account times the rate, which is 8%. How much money is in the 8%? We're calling that X. So the interest rate from the 8% is the amount of money in the 8% loan, and the interest rate, now we don't put 8%, we convert it to a decimal. Whenever you convert a decimal, I mean a percent to a decimal, it's like you move the decimal two places to the left. So 8% is really 0 0.08. So this right here is the interest from the 8% account. I need to add to it the interest from the 18% account. Well, what do I do? I take the amount of money in the 18% account times the interest rate, which is 18%. What's the amount of money in the 18%? It's right up here. I wrote it. 12,000 minus X. So 12,000 minus X This is the amount of money, and it gets multiplied by the interest rate, which is 18%, which as a decimal, it's 0.18. So to make it a little more clear, let's just write this as basically a math equation. I could say 1,000 equals 0.08x. Here, if I move the 0.8 in front of the parentheses, 0.18 times 12,000 minus X. So, I've accomplished my first goal. I've come up with an equation that sort of describes what's going on. And now, actually, I can solve this equation for X, and I will have solved the problem. So now it becomes a math problem. I need to go ahead and multiply out these parentheses, right, distributive property. So I'll have 1,000 equals 0 0.08x, 0 0.18 times 12,000. I've got my calculator here. It's 2,160 minus 0 0.18. 18x, right? So the 0 0.8, 0 0.18 gets distributed. Now to solve this, I'm going to subtract 2160 from both sides, send it up with negative 1160 here. On the right hand side, 0 0.08 minus 0 0.18, I believe is 0.1x. So I'm going to solve for x, divide. negative. And I believe you end up with 11,600 dollars. So this was the amount that was put into the 8% account. So actually almost all of it. So what was the amount put in the other account? It was like 400 dollars. Of course, they didn't ask for that, they asked for this. So basically, this is our answer, and now we've solved that problem. All right, so that was sort of a banking money problem. The key there is, it's all based upon this equation. The interest is the principal times the interest rate times time. Now another problem, which is totally unrelated to that one, <clears throat> this one is labeled it's labeled business mixing nuts so once again I'm going to read this and if you look in your homework I think you'll see a problem very similar so you can see how I did it and then try and do it yourself <clears throat> Let me read this one time. A nut store normally sells cashews for $9 per pound 
and almonds for $3.50 per pound. But at the end of the month, the almonds had not sold well. So in order to sell 60 pounds of almonds, the manager decided to mix the 60 pounds of almonds with some cashews and sell the mixture for $7.50 per pound. How many pounds of cashews should be mixed with the almonds to ensure no change in the profit? In other words, in the ideal case, the nuts are sold separately. Now here I'm going to write down, I'm going to read through the problem again and write down the information. It says a nut store normally sells cashews for $9 per pound. So the cashews, the price is normally $9 per pound, right? So if you buy two pounds, it costs you $18. Three pounds would cost you $27. And then it says the almonds, so the almond price is $3.50 per pound. It's like almonds are a lot cheaper, not as expensive. Now the problem is, at the end of the month, they were having a bunch of almonds left over, and in order to sell them, what they're going to do is they're going to take some almonds. Matter of fact, they're going to take 60 pounds of almonds, and they're going to mix it with some cashews to make like a mixture and then they're going to sell this mixture as a way to get rid of these extra almonds. Now the thing is, I do not know how many pounds of cashews got added. Matter of fact, that's what they're asking us. So I'm going to actually say the mixture was 60 pounds of almonds plus X pounds of cashews. So I don't know how many cashews. However, I do know that when they mixed this up together, they made the price of the mixture $7.50 per pound, which makes sense. You got to put the price somewhere in between the price of pure cashews and the price of almonds. So it's somewhere in the middle. So they did like this. So now they're saying, um, how much of this mixture, how many pounds of cashews did we add to this to sell all the almonds? Let's figure out, let's calculate how much money they made when they sold the mixture. Well, the money you make when you sell the mixture is, we know the price was $7.50 per pound, and you multiply this by the number of pounds of the mixture. What's the number of pounds of the mixture? 60 plus X. Right? Now let's go back. And what we have to do now is we have to say, how much money would they have made if they were able to not have to mix this together but if they could sell them separately. Money from selling nuts separately. In other words, you take 60 pounds of almonds and you sell them by themselves. And when you do that, the almond price is 350. So you take 350 times 60 pounds. So that's the money from the almonds, if they were sold by themselves. And then we add to it how much money we could have sold the cashews for. 
How many pounds of cashews did we end up throwing in the mixture? X. Well, if we had sold those separately, it's $9 per pound, and we had X pounds. So this is the money from the cashews. So in other words, in case you didn't get this, they decided to make this mixture. So we took 60 pounds of almonds and added X pounds of cashews. They sold it at $7.50 per pound. Here's the equation to tell us how much money we make from the mixture. But then they say, what would have happened instead of mixing the nuts together if we'd have sold them separately? Well, X pounds of cashews times $9 a pound plus 60 pounds of almonds times 350 per pound. Because what they want is they want to make sure that these are equal. In other words, they don't want to lose money by making this mixture. The mixture is just a way to sell it. They don't want to lose money. So basically we can set these two equal to each other. So we end up with, uh, it's just a pure math equation, 7.5 times 60 plus x equals, let me go ahead and multiply this out. I think 3.5 times 60, I think is 210 plus 9x. Now, if we solve this equation for x, then we've solved this problem. If I multiply out the parentheses, 7.5 times 60, 450 plus 7.5x equals 210 plus 9x. To solve this equation, get the x's on one side, the numbers on the other. If I subtract 7.5x from both sides, if I subtract 210 from both sides, now if I divide both sides by 1.5, Looks like they ended up mixing it with 160 pounds of cashews. All right. That's a story problem. The first time you do this it might be a real struggle, but the second time it's a little easier, the third time. And of course, the problems are not identical, but you start to see sort of patterns. All right, let's just do maybe one more, because like I said, I can't do all the story problems, but just to give you a feel for how to think about things. This last one is talking about a boat in the water. Actually, this problem is labeled physics uniform motion, crazy enough. But anyways, it says a motorboat can maintain a constant speed of 60 miles per hour relative to the water. The boat makes a trip upstream to a certain point in 20 minutes. The return trip takes 15 minutes. What is the speed of the current? So in other words, this is almost like, it's like the boat is in a river or a stream where there's a current. And what happens is you've got the speed of the boat by itself, how fast the boat can go by itself, but then you've got also the speed that the river or the stream is going at. And of course, when the boat is going upstream, it's fighting the current. The current is slowing the boat down. But then when you turn around and the boat is going downstream, then of course the stream is speeding the boat up and making it go faster. So let's write down what they've told us here. They say... It tells us the speed of the boat by itself, on its own, is 60 miles per hour. So that's how fast the boat can go just on its own. However, when the boat goes upstream, all it tells us is the trip took... 
20 minutes. And then it turned around and it went back. So it's almost like it's a round trip, right? It went upstream, turned around, and went back to the same place. When it went back, of course, it should not have taken as long because now it's going downstream. It took 15 minutes to return. And now based upon this information, they're asking us, what was the speed of the stream? Now this kind of problem, and in the future you're gonna learn any kind of problem where, I call them like travel problems where a boat is going, could be a plane is flying, could be a car is driving, could be someone is running, someone is bicycling. Anytime you're sort of moving or motion, this very famous equation, the distance you travel is the rate or the speed you're traveling times the amount of time you're traveling, right? Very common sense kind of equation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and apply this equation upstream and downstream. I know the distance it went for both of these is the same. So let's look at upstream. I know the time is 20 minutes. I'm going to do this. I'm going to call it distance upstream. How far did the bow go upstream? Well, first of all, let's look at it's time, right times time. Let's look at the time first. Upstream, it took 20 minutes. Be careful now, because when we're talking about speeds, we're talking miles per hour. You have to keep your units the same. If I'm talking about hours up here, I can't be talking about minutes down here. I have to, it's have to, it has to be either all hours or all minutes. You can't keep going back and forth. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to say 20 minutes is actually one-third of an hour. I'm converting minutes into hours. As a matter of fact, 15 minutes is one-fourth of an hour. So now I'm going to use these numbers for my time. I'm not going to use 20 or 15. I'm going to use the third and the fourth. So upstream, it's the speed times the time. I know the time upstream was one-third of an hour. Now what's the speed upstream? Since I'm trying to find the stream speed, I'm going to call that my variable x. Now when you go on upstream, the boat by itself can go 60 miles per hour, but it's fighting the stream. So what's the overall speed of the boat? We take the speed the boat could go by itself, and we actually have to subtract how fast the stream is going because the stream is slowing it down. It's making it go slower than it could go just on its own. Now, if I look at the distance the boat traveled downstream, what was the time? Well, downstream, it's one-fourth of an hour. How about the speed of the boat going downstream? Well, the boat by itself can go 16, but now the stream speed, x, is actually helping it go faster. So you add. You say the speed is 16 plus x. Now the whole key to this is, since it was a round trip, I know the distance up the stream and the distance down the stream is the same. So therefore, these two little equations here have to equal each other. So I can now simply set them equal to each other. And now I have a math equation which I can solve. So if I multiply out the parentheses, this fractions are going to make a little messy. 16 times a fourth is 4 plus 1 fourth x. So if I get the x's on one side, I'll add a third of x to both sides. 1 third x plus 1 fourth x equals 16 over 3 
minus 4. Wow, this is sort of messy. Um, 4 is like 12 over 3. This is like 4 thirds. Wow. Common denominator would be 12. So this is like 4 twelfths plus 3 twelfths. I think I end up with 7 twelfths x. Wow. Hope I don't mess up on this. So x would be 12 over 7 times 4 thirds. Hope I don't mess up on the math. I know my method's correct. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and grab my calculator now. 48 divided by 21. Looks like it's, if I round off to two places, 2.29 miles per hour. And I think that's actually the correct answer. All right. So that's story problems. I just wanted to do like three of these just to give you a taste. Unfortunately, I can't give you any quick and dirty ways to solve story problems easily. You just have to look at examples and think about it and fight through it. But the more you do them, the better you get. Sorry, that's the best I can give you.